got a Hershey bar and licorice whips. Juju bees and black wax lips. That's the stuff that makes a man a man. Forget your vegetable, you be free. You don't need no vitamin C. Eat your candy. We arrive in Canto 21 at Saturn, the heaven of the mystics. On the surface of Saturn, I saw a ladder, the color of sunstruck gold, reared up, reaching such skyish height that my eye couldn't climb to its limit. I saw so many bright beings descending its rungs, I thought every light in the sky was come suddenly cascading down it, just as jackdaws take flight at dawn. Such were the movements of those sparkling souls, that shower of stars, each time they cascaded to the ladder's next level, some perched, some dispersed, some levitated, deciding neither to go nor to stay. A car is once again the emblem of Dante's smooth and rapid transition from sphere to sphere. The birds are Dante's metaphor for the souls that rise and descend along Jacob's ladder represented unambiguously by the Mexican Loteria cards, whose repetition suggests levels of ascent, a point reinforced by the pink horizontal band, whose roses declare it represents another heaven. This anterior sky is the heaven of Jupiter, which Dante and Beatrice visited on their way from Mars to Saturn. Jupiter is the heaven of good rulers and is dominated by a great eagle, the spirit of justice. The eagle is also the emblem of the Holy Roman Empire, Dante's political obsession. This latter reference is acknowledged by the eagle's crown-like halo. Beatrice at lower right is echoed by the standing bird, reminding us that she too is a heavenly soul. The pearls on the car and the ladder pull together the levels of this complex composition and represent the starry souls that travel among these realms. Arrived in Canto 24, in the heaven of the stars, Dante meets St. Peter, who questions him regarding faith. The image for Peter is Monty Hall, iconic host of the game show Let's Make a Deal, who presented conundrums to his guests for nearly 30 years, from 1963 to 1991. This is Monty Hallowed, as his golden halo indicates, so resounding a comment on Dante's great catechism among the stars required visual space to echo in, so the rest of the composition is fairly restrained, with Dante and Beatrice placed among the pyrotechnic stars whose animating influence on all the lower worlds is noted by a spherical heater. Skipping over Dante's meetings with James and John, who question Dante about the other theological virtues, hope and love, Gross illustrates the primum mobile, the outermost of the physical heavens. Gross concentrates on one of Beatrice's speeches here. How religious thinkers exert themselves to seem original and brilliant, creating ingenious fictions for preachers to repeat while the Gospels sit silent by. One claims the moon swung back across the sky to eclipse the sun in the hour of Christ's passion, when there was darkness over all the earth, trying to make a miracle scientific, as though God's power were insufficient, or his word could not be trusted without physical proof, as though the truth were better swallowed, spiced with lies. Gross here addresses a major theme of Paradiso. Since this canticle takes place in a world of theological abstractions, Beatrice frequently corrects Dante's mistaken notions in astro-metaphysical detail. Here, the moon in Beatrice's speech is echoed with multiplied hilarity. The slices of yellow cheese next to the little golden moon beside her are, of course, a reference to the notion that the moon is made of cheese, a concept which represents ignorance and credulity, and is attested in English as far back as the 17th century. The larger moons above, in the psychedelic marbled paper night sky, ask, might the moon not actually be a sugared donut? That would explain the bright, dusty appearance. Beatrice scrubbing the angel bathtub suggests her cleanup of Dante's cosmology, while the bliss of heaven is intimated by the line illustration itself, 
from one of those mid-century ladies' magazines in which women were depicted keeping house with surreal cheer. A subtler bit of playfulness is the use of the white torn edge of the dark paper to integrate this component with the pale galactic swirls. In Canto 30, we are in the Empyrean, heaven proper, and Dante is vouchsafed several visions of the heavenly host, one of which is a river of light. My eyes were even equal to the sight of the river of light I now saw pouring down in a fiery stream, yellow and red between two banks which a supernatural springtime had emblazoned with blooms. The radiant waves shot out live sparks that flew among the flowers and settled in them so they looked like sunstruck rubies set in bezels of gold. Gross has translated the river image into a metaphoric road, which matches the meaning of Dante's vision. The earthly rivers of Dante's time, when paving was amongst the lost arts of antiquity, were primarily seen as highways. The road here is lined with trees that take account of the poem's celestial vegetation. The coruscating gold paper makes the road as fiery as the river Dante describes, and its sparkle quotes Dante's line, the radiant waves shot out live sparks. The sparks are picked up by the gold stars at bottom. As Dante's vision strengthens, he finds that the starry sparks are angels, like a squadron of bees descending to their delicious business in the flower beds. They brought heart's ease and love, for every blessing human hearts receive is delivered by its own particular angel. Thus Dante's angels minister to the assembled host of the saved in the Garden of Paradise. Gross has rendered those who receive these angelic attentions as ghostly silhouettes, for they are, after all, the souls of the faithful departed. In the sky, in a brilliant sphere that indicates she is a disembodied soul, a bikini Beatrice leads Dante on to the highest heaven. The last illustration, for Canto 30, shows Dante's ultimate vision of God. At bottom, it takes account of Dante's previous sightings of the heavenly host, which he saw not only as a river of light, but as a city, the New Jerusalem. Now, gazing up into the supreme Godhead, he says... There couldn't be a purer simplicity and unity than what I witnessed in the living fire. In the lofty depths of its brilliant substance there appeared three circles of different colors, but equally capacious. They contained the same. Dante sees the mystery of the Trinity in terms that derive from Aquinas and in primary shapes and colors that could have come from a Bauhaus textbook. The Mobius strip which enfolds the whole is a brilliant emblem of how a new third thing is created by two becoming one. Dante's threefold unity, which is the dialectic of joy. The final illumination comes when Dante sees a human figure in one of the circles that represents God, like a Vitruvian man demonstrating in his according proportions the mystery of the Incarnation. To express the concept in more general, less specifically Catholic terms, the mystery is how spirit can coexist with and in matter, that is, how a human being can experience the divine which is, as any scientist will tell you, beyond the limits of any possible physical perception. Gross has represented Dante's vision of the human divine in symbols that match his. She has made Dante himself the Vitruvian man placed him in the midst of the four images of Father, Son, Holy Ghost, and United Trinity, and given him a halo of illumination that is of a piece with their essence. With her circle-defining asterisks, she quotes the wheel and spokes of Dante's final metaphor. I would have lacked the wings for this farthest flight but a flash of illumination surpassing understanding answered the question as magically as the granting of a wish. I can't show you what I saw, but I'll tell you what I felt. 
my heart and mind were fully united in a single movement truth words, although in diametrically disagreeing places they advance together like two opposed spokes in a wheel turned by the love that directs the cycles of the sun and the planets and the stars. Can you